Thank you for watching my presentation. Today, I'm going to be talking about dictation programs for second language pronunciation learning, looking at perceptions of the transcript, strategy use, and improvement. I've actually been interested in dictation programs for quite a while. My first ASR dictation uh, study was my dissertation at Iowa State. Two main things draw me to dictation programs. The first is accessibility. So there are multiple free options if you're interested in doing ASR dictation. One example is Google's voice typing in Drive. But because these programs are often offered as accessibility software on operating systems, most students already have access to um, an ASR dictation program built into whatever devices they're using. You can also use some of them across multiple devices. Uh, Google voice typing, for example, can be used on PCs, Macs, or mobile devices, um, as long as they're using Chrome or another uh, Google-enabled program. Dictation programs also attract me because they're more flexible than CAPT programs. So CAPT um, programs, or programs specifically made for pronunciation teaching, will often provide a prompt for learners to say, follow, and then the learners will say it, and then the program's able to come back and provide feedback for the learners. Um, what the big downside of this is, though, is that learners don't have any say in the content that they cover, or teachers. Really, you have to follow the pre-designed content um, because it enables the feedback. The program has to know what you're trying to say. Dictation programs, on the other hand, don't have any content built in. And really, you're only limited by your, uh, your imagination in terms of what you could do with those programs. The programs hit the market, um, first hit the market in the 1980s for commercial use, um, for commercial and, and individual use. And there was some early interest in the 90s uh, as they started to gain popularity of whether we could use these types of programs for pronunciation learning. So one of the early studies was Conium, 1999, um, and another classic early study was During Monroe and Carbonaro in 2000. Uh, both, both studies were looking at Dragon Naturally Speaking, which was really a dominating force in the 90s. And they wanted to look at rates of recognition for non-native speech. If we look a little more closely at During Monroe and Carbonaro, they took 30 speakers uh, so 10 native English speakers, 10 L1 Chinese, and 10 L1 Spanish. And they asked them to read 60 sentences. Then they clipped two sentences from each person's recordings and then recreated the 60 sentences for a group of listeners. The group of listeners wrote down what they heard, rated the speaker for accentedness and comprehensibility, and then uh, researchers marked segmental errors. And they compared this data to what Dragon Naturally Speaking was able to transcribe from the audio recordings. And they found that there was insufficient recognition and specifically uh, the Derming Monroe and Carbonara study found no link to any of the human measures. And at the time they determined that dictation programs might have potential, but they weren't ready um, for use and pronunciation learning. Well, the field mostly deserted um, this area at that time because it didn't seem particularly fruitful. And there wasn't a lot of work done in it. Um, there was even some work by like, Strick and Neri that were pointing out that uh, maybe it's not suitable for pronunciation learning to begin with because it's not gonna give explicit feedback. But recently there has been renewed interest um, and studies have shown that the, that learners can improve their segmental accuracy using dictation programs. Uh, it's also useful for noticing pronunciation errors, particularly patterns of errors um, that are frequent. And learners introduced to dictation practice uh, report increased motivation and autonomy. But despite the renewed interest and the growing evidence that ASR dictation practice can benefit learners, there hasn't been a lot of research into how users actually engage with ASR dictation programs as part of pronunciation practice. Most of the studies that we've looked that I've looked at examine the dictation program after the learner has used it. Uh, so after the learner has transcribed, what is their improvement? Or after the learner 
has used it for practice? What are their reactions to the technology? On that note, there have been kind of mixed reactions from participants. Um, some find it very useful for pronunciation learning, but there's also a report of frustration when programs won't transcribe what they're trying to say. But there haven't been, as far as I'm aware, any studies that have looked at what actually happens during ASR dictation practice. So I wanted to look at this in my current study, uh, looking at how participants make sense of a provided transcript as feedback on their pronunciation, what resources and strategies participants make use of in their practice with dictation programs, and what is their relative frequency, and to what degree participants can improve the accuracy of the transcription, um, looking specifically at Google's ASR um, when they have to try a sentence over and over to get it correct. So I used 15 participants from a variety of language backgrounds. Um, I had seven Chinese speakers, five Spanish, um, one Arabic, one Japanese, and one Ambonese and Malay Indonesian speaker. Uh, participants reported an average age of about 25.8 and had spent um, an average of 17.7 years learning English. Their self-reported TOEFL score was an 87.4 on the IBT. They were split by gender, about 53% uh, were male, uh, while the remaining 47% uh, were female. Okay, so I had these participants come to my lab and after doing consent, we started with an introduction to tools and strategies that they could use in their practice. Um, so I showed them Youglish, which can do um, multiple uh, videos, files, all targeting uh, a specific item, lexical item or phrase. Um, and you can see multiple videos that play that um, word or, or phrase. I also showed them dictionary.com where they could look up a lexical item and not only receive the de definition, but also listen to audio recordings and see the IPA uh, for the term. Um, I also introduced them to the University of Iowa Sounds of Speech website, which allowed them to choose a segment and then see um, articulatory diagrams slash videos of how the sound is made, see a person, a uh, video of a person's mouth while they make the sound, and also hear example words with the sound. And then the final tool or strategy that they could, that I thought of that I introduced them to that they could request were many lessons. Uh, it proved a little difficult to do mini lessons through something like YouTube because videos could be quite long. Um, so for this, I ended up providing one or two sentences um, as a tip for how to produce whatever their target was uh, when they requested it. Now, students could learn, uh, could use any resource that they wanted to during their practice. Um, when they did the task, what the, the principal idea behind the task was that I audio recorded everything they did and they worked to dictate 60 different sentences. When they received a mistranscription on a sentence that they said, they would then think aloud um, they, or they were encouraged to think aloud. They weren't required to on every single time. Um, they were encouraged to think aloud about what they thought that feedback meant, that mistranscription meant. And uh, they were encouraged to use strategies before trying it again. And then they would try the task again um, until they were correct or until they hit four attempts, at which point I would often say, all right, would you like to move on to the next one? All right, so that was the task. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. The first research question was how do participants make sense of the provided transcript as feedback on their pronunciation? In table one, you can see the themes that I identified. I did use Osborne's 2003 um, study as a starting point, uh, and they had identified focus on articulatory gestures, um, single sound focus uh, versus individual syllable focus, uh, focus to the prosodic structure, and so on. Um, I did use that as a starting point, but the six that I ended up with were uh, focus on a segment, focus on a super segmental feature, uh, focus on the word as a whole, uh, focus on an articulatory feature, focus on speed or focus on their uncertainty and questions. And uh, a particular attempt uh, or comments could be coded as multiple. Um, and that is important because uncertainty and questions came up a lot, but it was often paired with a hypothesis. Um, 
about the word as a whole or the segment or so on. Uh, so it rarely occurred on its own. You can see in the table that I've broken it down by the different attempts. Um, the final column is actually how many participants across all of their attempts um, had tried or, or had reported a particular focus. Um, so the first thing uh, that's probably quite noticeable is moving from uh, attempt one, uh, the most the most reported focus was on the word as a whole. Uh, so that was 35%. One thing to point out is that um, the sentences that were available decreased because as participants um, perfected their sentence or the transcript of their sentence, they didn't have to keep repeating. So you'll see that um, the total possible line gives you the number of sentences um, that were actually moving through uh, that stage. The second most common um, focus was uncertainty of questions. But as I mentioned, it was often paired with a hypothesis. So they weren't sure what was going on, but they did often have some kind of idea. Those were actually the only two that all participants used across all of their attempts. Um, but notably, the third most common strategy or focus was on the segment. And this is actually something that shows up um, as fairly rare in other work, including Osborne, but also uh, a study of uh, strategy use in CAPT pronunciation program uh, practice. Uh, so it may be that um, ASR dictation practice was particularly useful in getting participants to pay attention to the segment. Uh, 14 out of the 15 participants at some point reported a focus on a particular segment. Um, I also found slightly higher than um, average or higher than previously reported focus on the articulatory features. So the second question then was, what resources and strategies do participants make use of in their practice with dictation programs? And what is their relative frequency? So to start off with this one, I used Peterson 2000, which tried to list um, a bunch of pronunciation learning strategies and then categorize them um, by type. Uh, so I tried to fit my the strategies that I found into that framework as best I could. Um, participants did use all, um, all of the strategies that I introduced were used at some point, maybe not by all participants, um, but using the dictionary, using Uglish, using the articulatory uh, mini lesson, and then uh, using Iowa sounds of speech. There were two major areas of strategies that appeared that I had not introduced. Um, and one of them was quite frequently used, which is covert rehearsal. Covert rehearsal um, makes up the first three lines of table two. Um, I looked at, uh, sorry, covert rehearsal, um, I'm just simply using that term to refer to uh, individual practice, private practice with self-monitoring. So you're not using someone else to practice, you're just listening to yourself to say it. I did break um, this into covert rehearsal of the target word, um, but also covert rehearsal of the transcribed word. So what you're trying to say versus what the program transcribed. And you'll see that that distinction is also made for the dictionary. Uh, and then finally, also covert rehearsal of the phrase, um, because sometimes they would take the word out individually, but then try to put it back in the phrase before they tried the sentence again. And I thought it was important to count um, that separately, although um, I did not recount the term if it was embedded within a phrase. And then finally, the last one that came up was using the ASR program that we already had open um, to turn it back and turn it back on and only just try the one targeted word um, so that you could practice it out of context and then try you to use the program uh, when putting it back into context in the sentence. Okay, jumping over to look at um, how frequent the different strategies were used. Um, one of the things that we see is that covert rehearsal of the target and covert rehearsal of the transcribed, um, along with dictionary listening to the target were the ones that all of the participants used at some point. The most frequently used was covert rehearsal of the target. And you can see that that's across all of the attempts. Um, the only change in pattern that I tended to see was that um, I, looking at post attempt three, I, tend, I saw that covert rehearsal of the target tended to go down and reliance on an external source tended to go up um, a little bit. Um, so you can see that uh, dictionary listening to the tr uh, transcribed word went up a little bit. 
Um, use of Euglish went up a little bit. Uh, so you can see a little bit of shifting, but really um, it was fairly consistent across. Um, and when we combine all of the uses together, what becomes immediately clear is that covert rehearsal made up a huge amount of the strategies in their pronunciation practice with the dictation programs, which was somewhat surprising. Um, in previous work, my, uh, I have a 2019 article where I found that learners reported using um, e-dictionaries, and that was one of the primary things that they reported uh, finding handy. But very few students reported uh, covert rehearsal. I think only one mentioned it, um, if I can remember correctly, only one mentioned it in the previous study. And yet, um, it's making up um, almost 70% of the strategy use in this study. Uh, so it does kind of highlight how important it is to look at um, beyond, look beyond just the studies that capture data at the end, but to look at the practice while it's happening. Okay, um, the final thing that, the final question that we, I wanted to look at is to what degree can participants improve the accuracy of the transcript provided by Google's ASR in subsequent attempts? And um, I struggled a little bit to figure out how to display this in a meaningful way um, to anyone else. Um, what I came up with was um, looking at the sentences as set. So um, there were 900 sentences that went through attempt one, and I have that plotted as the blue dot. But then only 383 of those moved from attempt one to attempt two. So that's the orange line. Um, but then I had, then we cut out more, right? So as participants perfected the transcript, they didn't have to continue. Uh, so only 179 sentences moved from attempt two to three. Uh, so you can see this disjointed line. What's probably most um, noticeable about the graphic is that participants were able to improve from attempt one to two and then from two to three. But after three, moving into attempt four, it seems like the average uh, transcript accuracy actually went down. Um, so it might be that the participants have maxed out uh, what they can glean uh, from a transcript by the end of a third attempt, or that some other kind of intervention might be necessary, maybe um, a teacher's lesson on that feature um, or something more intensive to, to get students making progress on that feature. Okay. So some of the big findings or big things that I um, took from this study. Um, first of all, although Sirkanel um, had raised concerns that dictation transcripts might not really be useful as feedback because they don't provide explicit feedback, learners in this study were able to use the transcript as feedback, um, regularly making hypotheses about what the transcript meant and they particularly focused on the word level and segment level. One of the important findings was that every participant noticed some form of pattern of errors during their practice, and 40% of participants were actually able to link the errors to a particular segment that was occurring across multiple words. In terms of focus following an error, there would seem to be increased reporting of segmental and articulatory feature focus than um, a lot of previous studies that looked um, as strategy used more broadly or strategy used in CAPT training. The most used strategies were self uh, covert rehearsal, self rehearsal, and dictionary lookup. Um, and that does add to an understanding of what students are doing with dictation work because previously uh, students had been primarily reporting e dictionary use uh, in my 2019, one of my 2019 articles. Finally, um, it's the study found that learners were able to improve their transcript. 91% um, of cases um, had achieved a perfect transcript by the third attempt. And that remaining 9% um, didn't seem to be particularly aided by a fourth attempt, suggesting that sending students to repeat multiple times, um, you know, maybe sending them to try a couple, three times. Um, might be more useful, but to limit frustration, that fourth attempt, and maybe a fifth attempt, well, I didn't study a fifth attempt, um, might not be as useful. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you were interested in this study, I do have the full text um, published through Conan Language Studies, uh, as well as the full list of references. Thank you again.